Here he is, a younger version of myself talking about Fidenza NFTs and how they were trading at 5 ETH, which at the time was a 50x gain from their launch. And today, about two months later, the Denzas have a floor of almost 300 ETH. And you know what? I have a feeling I'm gonna do another video in the future few years from now, maybe quoting this video and talking about how Fidenza's 10x again to 3000 ETH. How's that for Inception? And if you're curious, the answer is no, I did not buy one of those Fidenza's after making that video. But then why am I bringing this up? Well, it's because I've been getting a very similar question recently, which is, do I think the NFT market is in a bubble? And do I think that we're due for a correction or even worse, some kind of collapse? And the thing is that things are going very well right now. You know, many NFTs are up. And usually when that happens, you'll have people fall into two different camps. On one side, you'll have people say that, you know, this is euphoria and I'm seeing all these signs that we're hitting a top here. And then you have other people that go, no, you can't compare this to older markets. This one is different because of X, Y, and Z. And of course, the truth is always more nuanced than that. And so I think it's a little bit of both. First off, NFTs are not a fad. You know, it's a groundbreaking technology that 99% of people still don't understand or even appreciate how much of an impact it's going to have across many different sectors. NFT collectibles are also not a fad. I think we're hitting on some very deep human psychology with these collectibles. And I really do think that the adjustable market is going to expand exponentially in the coming years. I have high conviction in that. But at the same time, I know that a lot of junk is being sold today. And that's partly because, you know, we're also new to this space and we still don't know how to compare value across a bunch of these projects. So instead of thinking too hard about the pricing, we just give into the FOMO, jump in wherever we can you know, shoot first and ask questions later. And if we look at the NFT market today, you can really split it into two different buckets. You know, you have the blue chips, which are NFTs that have some kind of an anchor in value. And for that reason, people think that it could remain valuable for long periods of time. And then you have the rest of the market, which is people trying to buy NFTs that they hope could turn into a blue chip one day. And I'm gonna do a magic trick here and guess that the majority of you are spending most of your time in this rest of the market category because these blue chip NFTs are just wildly expensive at this point. But in this video, I'm gonna explain why NFT investors that don't get exposure to this blue chip category, even if it's through fractions, are in for a bad time when we do eventually have some kind of a bear market. And also the ones that I'm personally buying into right now to round out my portfolio. Hey, so just wanted to jump in here to make a quick point because I know some of y'all don't watch the whole video, not everyone, but you know who you are. So basically I wanna stress that we now have fractional NFTs, so you can put any small amount towards these blue chip NFTs. And later in the video, I'll explain why they still have a lot of room for growth. Don't look at the price and just assume that you can't get exposure to them. And in my opinion, many of these NFTs will actually outperform a lot of popular blockchains over the next decade. The point I wanna make is that you don't want to have all of your eggs with super speculative NFT projects when we know that some specific ones are already locked in for the future. All right, let's go back. Now, first off, let's define what a blue chip NFT even is. You know, this is a term that comes from stock investing and it doesn't have a perfect fit here, but it's the best we got. A blue chip NFT is an NFT that has been proven to be very valuable by consensus. Many collectors aspire to own these NFTs and try to trade their way into acquiring one. As a result of this broad demand, they become less risky over time. Now that might seem like any NFT could become a blue chip and maybe that's true, but there are a few common paths that have shown to be reliable in getting NFTs to that blue chip category. The first one of these paths is the genre of NFT archaeology. This is a search for early NFT projects, you know, projects that help define the standards that we use today. Many of these projects came out between 2016 and 2018, and some examples would be Curio Cards, Ether Rocks, Autoglyphs, and of course, CryptoPunks. Right this moment, there are probably hundreds of people scouring the blockchain records from that time to try to find you know, new early NFT projects that people have missed. And the reason they do this is because every time one of these pops up, there seems to be a lot of attention from whales and some of them sell for astronomical prices. And at this point, every week, I feel like I hear of a new one. For example, here's a project called Realms of Ether that was recently discovered and one that I haven't heard discussed on YouTube yet. This was a project from late 2017 and one of the earliest NFT games ever made. And it had a cap of 500 NFTs, but it looks like the majority of all of the NFTs that were minted in this contract are in dead wallets. And the other half were recently minted in 2021 when this project was rediscovered. So it's pretty scarce with a low supply, but my question is, do these newly minted NFTs still have a lot of collectible value just by being part of a contract that was formed in 2017, even though they weren't minted until 2021? 
In other words, how much value do you give an NFT just by having the potential of being minted many years ago? Those are the questions you have to ask yourself. And I personally didn't buy in, but I can see why others would, especially if you're going deep on this angle. And, you know, hopefully it's not something I regret, but it's always possible that this ends up being one of those Fidenza videos that I talk about a year from now. But anyways, that's just a sidebar. The fact is that there's already a list of projects that the community has formed a consensus around being historically significant NFTs. And that's going to be true in 2021, but it'll also be true in 3031 as long as people still know about Ethereum. And then in the second path to blue chip status, we have art. And you know, this is less objective than the archeology, span but it doesn't make it any less valuable. For example, you might think that your local favorite artist is actually better than Pablo Picasso, but because there's so much overwhelming cultural consensus behind the value of Picasso's work, you can rest assured that Picasso paintings will always be amongst the most valuable art pieces in the world. And that's because of the story being told by the community. And even though the NFT space is pretty new, we already have some examples of what would be considered blue chip art pieces. The most high profile example would probably be Beeple. This is the artist that basically conquered the NFT market back in March with some mega sales, including one that sold for $69 million, which is still the most expensive NFT to date. Beyond that, we're basically seeing an art renaissance emerge from the Artblocks community. And if you don't know what Artblocks is, I have an entire video on it that you can check up here. But basically, they specialize in generative art, which could be an entirely new era in art history that is unfolding in real time right before our eyes. And from our blocks, we've already had a few collections that could be considered as blue chips. You have, of course, the Fidenzas, which we already mentioned. And this is probably the closest thing to a masterpiece that we've seen from our blocks. Then you have Ringers, which has a floor of 185 ETH. You have Archetypes with a floor of 73 ETH and Subscapes with a floor of 45 ETH. There could be more, but these are definitely considered by most to be near or already at blue chip status. Okay, and then finally, the third path to blue chip status would be an NFT that can be part of a cultural event or become a legendary brand. And it's hard to pin this one down, but essentially these are NFTs that might not have the historical anchor that something like CryptoPunks would have, and it might not have the beautiful art that something like Fidenzas have. But they've done enough to create a brand that many would consider elite status and something that's difficult to replace. I think so far we haven't seen, you know, one of these brands emerge from the NFT community just yet because it's also new and it's hard to say that, you know, just because something is culturally significant today, that it's still even gonna be around in five years without one of those, you know, anchors of value. But the closest thing we have would probably be the Bored Apes, which has a floor of 50 ETH right now, and which many would consider to be the best brand to emerge from the NFT market this year. When you're buying an NFT profile pick collection, this is probably the path that you would likely take if you get to blue chip status, but it is the most difficult of the three paths because there's more that can go wrong. In other words, the thesis isn't just as simple as being the first NFT to do something. All right, with that said, now let's talk about why these blue chip NFTs are likelier to retain their value during a bear market and why that's a reason that people are willing to spend so much money on them. So reason number one is just that these NFTs are easier to value from an outsider perspective. And for that reason, they're gonna be getting immense attention from traditional collectors as they come into the NFT space. Remember, the global collectibles market is valued at $370 billion. And most of that comes from basically super rich people buying things like classic cars, art, and rare books. And a lot of that money is going to flow into the NFT space, but they're going to disproportionately flow to the top 1% of assets. When these collectors come in, they're gonna ask, what are the best NFTs and why? You know, they're not gonna be spending time in the bargain bin trying to find the next board ape. That's just not their game. Instead, they're gonna go straight to the top shelf and find whatever brands have consensus around them because those are just less risky. And the reason this matters is because these collectors tend to have much longer investment horizons. And that's because one, they're already used to buying into illiquid asset classes. And two, they don't need that money in the same way that you and I do. So they can just let it sit there and let it ride. If we look at traditional art, for example, it's often recommended that you plan to hold for at least seven years, but much more likely it's gonna be for 10 years or more. So when these blue chip NFTs fall into the hands of these collectors, they're basically gone for good. And that drives up liquidity, which means the remaining NFTs on the market, you know, their prices get sent to astronomical levels far beyond what a normal project would. The second reason these blue chips will weather a bear market is because of the coming wave of DeFi applications or decentralized finance. So one clear example would be using your NFT as collateral to get a loan. And this is something that already happens a lot in traditional art. But with DeFi, you know, this is gonna be much more commonplace and you're gonna be able to do it in a trustless way using the blockchain. This means that people can buy an NFT but still take money out through a loan 
and then use that in other parts of DeFi to get a yield in a less risky way, which in my opinion makes this collectible class much better than traditional physical collectibles. However, the problem is that lenders are still extremely skeptical of NFTs because of the volatility. And also from the perspective of the person putting up the NFT, you also have to consider volatility because a huge price swing could mean that you get liquidated. Just taking a look at something like Pudgy Penguins and you can see that it has like 40% swings in price on a daily basis. And so you wouldn't really want to build a strategy around leveraging an NFT like that because you can get cleaned out pretty fast. But blue chip NFTs will become less risky because of some of the things we've already mentioned, right? The holders are less likely to flip and they have longer investment horizons. These NFTs are also not dependent on external factors like other projects might be and they're much less likely to be replaced by whatever the flavor of the month or the next hot thing is. And as a result, price becomes steady, they become like a store of value, and lenders feel much more confident using those NFTs as collateral for loans. And the ability to use your NFT in a financial stack, to be able to leverage it to get into more deals, all while knowing that the price isn't gonna swing dramatically on you, that's extremely powerful and it's going to make it likely that more people will want to buy in. And not just individuals, we're also going to be seeing institutions buying into these NFTs in order to get exposure to the NFT market in the least risky way possible. That's why we see venture funds like Three Arrows buying up CryptoPunks and not something like Cool Cats because Cool Cats, as much as I love them, are more dependent on the team and the community to derive part of their value compared to something like CryptoPunks, which is now running on the engine of provenance and history which nobody can take away from them. That's not to say that Cool Cats can outperform CryptoPunks over the next five years. You know, it's easier to grow from a lower price point, but there are more things that could go wrong. So look, if you're watching these videos, then you're extremely early to a market that's about to, you know, blossom. But if you're not buying the blue chips, then what you're doing is playing a game of musical chairs where people keep flipping collection to collection. And there's a lot of luck that comes into play into figuring out which one can even survive. Personally, I just bought up some fractions of this CryptoPunk and this Fidenza on fractional.art. And these are two collections that I strongly believe are going to be much more valuable in five years than they are now. And they'll be assets that I won't feel a strong need to sell during an NFT bear market, which is something that I can't say of all the other NFTs that I own. And for those that want a bigger list, here are other NFTs that I think are either blue chips already or have a high chance of ending up as one through one of the paths that I laid out earlier. But none of this is guaranteed, so please do your own research. You know, many of these are available on fractional.art already as fractions. So just make sure you look at the implied valuations and how that compares to the floor valuations for those NFTs on OpenSea to make sure that you're not getting a terrible deal. All right, guys, hope that was helpful. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next video.